Uh, once again, uh, my name is Arnold Viersen. I'm the member of Parliament for Peace River Westlock. And if you're seeing this on Facebook, uh, you probably already knew that, but uh, nonetheless, thanks for joining us this evening. I, uh, I'm, we are honored to have in our presence uh, the, the legendary, I was looking for a good <laughs> word on that, the legendary Shannon Stubbs. So welcome mm -hmm. Shannon to Northern Alberta, Peace River Westlock, or as I like to call it, the promised land. <laughs> you do. Yes, I think we have some arguments about that, about our respective constituencies. Yeah, thanks, Arnold. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Shannon and I uh, met uh, when we were both elected in 2015, and uh, our seats were actually right beside each other in the House of Commons for the first number of months. Uh, um, that, that, those were some, that was a long time ago, it feels like, Shannon. It does feel like a long time ago, doesn't it? And like we've been banging our head against a brick wall for every single second of every day since then too. Actually, Arnold, a Facebook um, memory popped up for me just this morning. And so you are, I think, a little more technological than I am. I'm not, I don't really have too many skills in that regard. But when we were fighting and fighting and fighting against the liberal closure of that immigration office in Vegreville, one oh, yeah. day, I think it was, it was one of the days when I was asking questions in the House of Commons and I was nervous or something. And you made this like a ridiculous thing of me in like military fatigue sort of thing and had me positioned as this like warrior fighting for Baker Boat member. You left the piece yeah, of yeah. paper on my desk and it popped up in the Facebook memory this morning. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I uh, like I put your face on a soldier or something like that, and I yeah. the caption was Vagraville, We stand on guard for you for the yes, or something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those were that was uh, that was a while back for sure, no doubt. That was so. And then we had it. It was uh, uh, Shannon on one side and Kathy Wagenthal on the other side, and I just remember Kathy was like our mom. Uh, <laughs> Shannon and I were. The two, the two young ones there, and then uh, Kathy was always trying to rein us in. So yes. those are the uh, a little more dignified than the yeah. two of us. I the, think you ended up. I think you ended up developing a tactic where you know when you were giving your input into the proceedings in the chamber, otherwise known as heckling. Um, I think didn't you? didn't you adopt a thing where you would just sort of lean a little bit and then you couldn't be identified and your voice would go booming across with, I thought, always accurate things to say, like they were lying and things like that. Yeah. 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 And how, how many times did they talk to the ethics commissioner? Yeah. I learned French very quickly that way. Uh, com combien de fois, um, <laughs> which, which means how many times. And, how many uh, times? How many times? Yeah, that's, that's like some of the very limited French that I've learned. Uh, since being members of parliament, but uh, uh, when when necessity ma makes it a requirement, I can learn French in a hurry, it turns out. Yeah. So. But yeah, that's true. I noticed that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah so. Speaking of how many times, look, they look at the ethics commissioner who's come back and said that Morneau violated. Well, I guess it was obvious to maybe everybody except him, but violated the ethics legislation over their whole We Charity scandal. And our friends on the ethics committee is still trying to get answers on that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you won the McLean's Parliament Parliamentarian Award a couple of times. What did you win that for? Arnold. Um, yes, I did. And I'm grateful, uh, really grateful for that. I think the first time was 2017. And then just in this past year, which shocked me, and um, I guess if you have to get a word that, you know, politicians and pundits put their heads together and, and give them out secretly, I think the one that um, everybody voted for me for is the one that I care the most about. And it's for best representing constituents. So that was really, yeah, that's a, that was a really meaningful, special thing for me. I, um, I always think at the end of the day, the opinions I only really care about are the people of Lakeland. Um, but it sure is a meaningful thing to know that, you know, colleagues got together and 
And I guess even must have been a few colleagues from other parties too, who uh, would have marked my name down for that particular category. So I really, really appreciate that. I'm grateful to have been given lots of opportunities to fight on the issues that matter to people in Lakeland. So, you know, you don't do it alone as we, as none of us do, right? Yeah, so you've been a shadow critic for natural resources in the past, and that was uh, um, that was definitely your wheelhouse. Uh, tell us a little bit about like kind of your coming into politics and and uh, being an advocate around our natural resource development. Well, I was very grateful to uh, be able to work on that file right off the bat, right, uh, like you said, right after. When the 2015 election, I was made the deputy critic uh, for natural resources when Ron Ambrose was our interim leader. And then, um, so I worked with Candace Bergen and Mark Strahl there. And then when Andrew Shear was elected leader, he bumped me up to be the shadow minister for natural resources. And it was during a really pivotal time for, um, you know, for for the sector, but I, you know, also for our province in particular, um, together we fought against Bill C-69 and against Bill C-48. Uh, and, you know, we, I was really proud to be able to take um, aggressive positions as we did in support of the Energy East pipeline before the Liberals uh, meddled around with it and kept moving the goalposts and moving the benchmarks and deliberately, uh, you know, in order for the proponent to finally give up and, and bail out. Um, and then, of course, we, you and everybody in the Conservative Party are such staunch advocates for pipelines in all directions. So for the Trans Mountain expansion, we were very active on pressing the government just to give the legal and political certainty that the private sector proponent needed to get that pipeline built after it had gone through the years of rigorous, uh, strenuous regulatory um, approvals and review. Canada, of course, having the toughest um, standards and review and, and, uh, and know-how of any oil and gas producing jurisdiction on earth. Um, but of course it ran into you know, barrier after barrier and the federal government just refused to give it that legal and political certainty it needed. You, you'll recall, yeah, it does seem like a while ago here, you'll recall we, uh, we, I was happy to sponsor in from the Senate that legislation that would have declared the Trans Mountain expansion in the general advantage of Canada. And we tried a bunch of times and concert, you and all conservatives supported this. We tried to expedite that through that bill so that that could be done um, quickly. And of course, every time we ask for unanimous consent, well, first of all, I think it was an NDP MP who turned it down the first time, and then a block, and then finally a liberal did. Um, and then, you know, and then we just know the fiasco that happened after that, spending millions of dollars of tax dollars, uh, taxpayers' uh, dollars needlessly. And frankly, it's still sort of hobbling along with a variety of challenges. And then, same thing with Keystone XL, you know, when it first hit a couple of, um, legal legal bumps and legal challenges in the US, we came out immediately and I at that time said, you know, the Canadian government should be offering any and all legal resources required to the proponent to take on those legal challenges in the US. Of course, the Liberals did nothing. And then what happened as soon as, you know, as soon as this new administration in the US came in, they, they killed it. But now we even look at line five, I mean, I don't know what you're hearing in your area, Arnold, but I sure do hear from a lot of people in my constituency and, and also across the country to an extent, people kind of saying, you know, obviously we all recognize this is crucial pipeline infrastructure, but maybe if the US, you know, stops it, that will teach everybody in the hardest possible way, a real lesson about how necessary pipeline infrastructure is and oil and gas is to the whole country. And, um, but look, these, you know, so the Liberals, of course, they seem more, um, they're kind of more animated about this pipeline than they have been about any other ones. I'd suggest this probably because it, you know, supports Pearson and Pearson Airport and, and Ontario and Quebec predominantly. But, um, but at the same time, it's, you know, at the very last minute that they put in their legal challenge, it's just been such a fiasco. So um, all that culminated, Arnold, in, remember in our 2019 campaign running on support of a national energy corridor. And I was really, yeah, I was really proud to be, 
to be part of developing that policy. And um, I thought it was uh, an important thing for us to run on uh, to talk about the importance of Canadian energy, self-sufficiency and security and Canadian energy independence. Yeah, oh, no, no, no I'm just going to talk about energy for <laughs> an hour. No, you got me started. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's for sure. Um, before you were elected, you worked in the in Alberta legislature um, on some of these issues as well, if, if my memory serves me well. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Well, you know what? I um, I have I've worked in the public service too, and I worked in the um, Alberta Department of Energy in the oil sands business unit um, in the early two thousands for a few years, and then after that was um, recruited into uh, the Department of Economic Development in the International Offices and Trade Division, and that's where I was um, really grateful to be able to work on a project called the Heavy Oil Alberta Project, which was an international um, promotional project for Alberta's heavy oil um, resources, obviously, but also our technology, our innovation, our regulatory expertise, our service and supply companies. And out of that, we created the, the um, Alberta uh, Alberta's heavy oil and oil sands guidebook and directory. And I guess um, what I'm really happy about is, uh, you know, it started with the partnership between the government of Alberta and our project, and then the private sector. But since that project came to an end, it's, um, it's been continued on in the private sector with no government funds. So, you know, as okay. a limited government free market conservative, that makes me happy to know that it was carried on in the private sector, because I'm a little skeptical, uh, you know, uh, probably like you are, and many of our constituents are about uh, about projects that governments come up with, but and then yeah, I was I was involved in, in a variety of provincial politics um, uh, before I uh, before getting elected in um, yeah yeah in 2015 federally too yeah. And currently, you're the shadow minister for public safety and emergency preparedness. Um, that's uh, so you're kind of the shadow minister up against uh, Bill Blair. Is yes, that correct? that's right. Yeah. Yes, okay, exactly and you, right. so then you, uh, and there's a committee for public safety. Is that the committee you sit on? Yeah, so I, that's right. So I'm also the vice chair for it's the public safety and national security um, standing committee. Yeah. Okay. And that's, and, we got a, I don't know, I hope you won't mind me saying this publicly, but our chair is John McKay, and he, he tends to be, well, you probably could speak to this a little bit. I think that he's supported you and some of your initiatives and letters signing on to some of the yeah. things that you've advocated on. He tends to be a, a bit of an independent minded liberal. And um, I think sometimes not always, well, not sort of the Justin Trudeau, like socialist left liberal. Um, I think he'd be more of a moderate liberal and he certainly shares our views on, you know, foreign interference and the threat of China and Russia to Canada, um, to our national security, our economic security, the internet in, and to the individual, you know, private and personal security of Canadians. And I think there was a motion that we did recently, didn't we, Arnold, was it on banning Huawei or was, and maybe it was also yeah, the on the genocide of the genocide okay, in been, China and he we, supported we us. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so he's, like, he's been a champion of the like supply chain reporting, um, like anti-human trafficking piece of legislation for over 10 years. He's been pushing that. Yes. And, uh, so yes. that's what I've been working with him on a bit. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 So he's, he's also the co-chair, one of the co-chairs of the all party group 10 human trafficking. Yes. Um, that's right. For the last year and a half now. So it's this parliament anyway so yeah that, okay. i do know him yeah. fairly well and you got a private members bill supporting yeah orphan um, wells yes well yeah. and um i guess not so shockingly uh the liberals voted it down but this is a um i, I i'm I, i'm it must be a challenge in your riding too um part of the part of the byproduct of all of the anti-energy legislation and policies over the last six years that has uh, driven away energy investment and caused energy companies to, you know, pause their projects or pull out of Canada entirely. One of the offshoots of that has been a 300% increase in orphan oil and gas wells. And I um, always am careful and want to make sure that I point out in 
it is not been a case of you know, energy companies um, not wanting to meet their environmental obligations or, you know, getting in there with a project and taking off without a care. Um, in many cases, it, you know, until very recently, it wasn't even a, a case of the orphan well associations mismanaging situations. It's just literally there has been this massive spike um, that coincides with companies going bankrupt. And so that has in a way overwhelmed um, many of the provincial programs ability to deal with this orphan oil and gas well. So I thought, oh, well, what's a, you know, lots of this is provincial different, different jurisdiction issues, but what's a way that, you know, we could make a difference federally, even if it's a small contribution. And what I ended up coming up with was this way for um that could be established which was the establishment of a tax credit and then the government would have to implement a flow through share provision and this would allow small and medium-sized oil and gas companies and the bill was directly targeted to small and medium-sized oil and gas companies um and that would allow them to help raise money uh privately in order to take care of their outstanding oil and gas wells um, because another thing that happened to ha that happened concurrent with this um, with the collapse in investment is this Supreme Court decision in 2019 that I think lots of people would agree with the you know with the concept of the decision. Of course, it was you know, certainly we would. It was the federal conservative government under Prime Minister Stephen Harper who implemented the polluter pay principle and you know, unlike what the, the left says, um, you know, our, you know, all governments in Canada, particularly in Alberta, have had extremely strong, have had an extremely strong track record on environmental remediation um, through the course of responsible oil and gas development. And, but what happened was there was this Supreme Court decision that happened that said, basically, okay, if you're a, uh, if you're a company, you're kind of teetering on the edge of bankruptcy, you're going to the market to try to raise capital. Um, what has to happen is your environmental outstanding liabilities are the ones that have to be managed first. And so what happened, especially for the small and medium sized guys, is that then they're going to the market. The big financiers are saying, I can't see any return on investment here. No money for you. So I thought, well, here is a very targeted, specific sort of surgical way um, that we can make a federal contribution here that small and medium sized oil and gas companies could go to the market because there would be this tax credit that would be available to make it profitable for investors. Um, so they would be able to put that into specifically remediation reclamation of their orphan oil and gas wells. Um, it even had a timeline on it. You know, it was like sort of a five year sunset clause and then it could be re reviewed. And I thought, well, this is a way to at least give a little bit of a lifeline for um, the most at risk, most vulnerable uh, oil and gas companies to be able to, to raise some money from the private sector, and most importantly, then also protect taxpayers in the long run. Because either way, all of this will end up um, falling on taxpayers if we don't figure out how the private sector can take care of it in the first place. And of course, Arnold, so wouldn't you, I mean, I thought this is win, win, win all the way around, right? And they try to say conservatives don't care about the environment, conservatives, certainly the odd person has called me a shill for the oil and gas industry now and then, you know, all the things they say. And they just one by one by one voted it down. Yet the crazy thing is, it's not like this provision doesn't exist for other industries, it exists for all kinds of industries. It exists for mining, um, you know, it exists for extraction. But um, I don't know, I think I think this is one of the moments where the liberals partisanship or their anti energy ideology, you know, took over the what was, I think, a, a good justification and the need for this private members bill, but we supported it. And then um, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about admitting this, but the Green Party actually supported the bill. Now, I think they came at it from their sort of, you know, doomsday ending the industry perspective. My motivation is obviously the exact opposite. It's to see the industry continue to thrive and grow. But um, I guess it, I, I thought it was pretty ironic that these liberals who were always sort of trying to out environment the green and out environment the NDP were against it while the greens actually supported it. But There you go. Uh, so the, um, 
at the risk of uh, doing a bait and switch on everybody, I, I did say that this was about protecting children. Um, that was how we advertised this thing. And so let's, uh, let's turn to that a little bit. Um, you and I participated in the ethics committee uh, recently, um, basically around a study to deal with a company called Pornhub. Um, I don't know if you can just explain from your perspective uh, the situation and what the study was about and and uh, some of what the study what happened at the study so yeah sure but first of all before I, I talk about that Arnold I want to say something that I know you always hate me saying and you're probably wishing I wouldn't right now but but I'm going to um I you're very humble and modest when you say you and I participated in this committee to be clear I think you've led the fight on this issue um, and it's you who knocked my door down and blew up my emails and were really advocating on this um, back in the fall. And I know you had already been working on the issue for a long time. So um, you say that in your, your classic kind of self-deprecating and modest way, but I think you should be recognized for your leadership and your tenacity. Um, on Well, on the issues of human traffic on protecting vulnerable people, but on this issue of uh, fighting for justice when it comes to Pornhub and MindGeek overall. Um, so I want to thank you for that. And I hope that your your constituents know that you have been, uh, in my opinion, kind of uh, well, an unsung hero um, on this issue. And so, yeah, I, that, uh, I think that you were probably better prepared going into those community meetings than I was. I um, was uh, very shocked and very rattled and very troubled by everything that we listen to. And I think, uh, I think most Canadians probably have no idea um, what is going on there. So I guess Pornhub is, is it like the most, I think it's like the most viewed porn site in the whole world or right. It's massive. And the issue is that most, there are, most viewed, what? Sorry, what did you say? Most most viewed uh, website in the world. Um, in the world, so it's like not even, not even, not even porn site, just most viewed website. So it's like they get right. more views than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter every yes, day. Yes, and I um, that's right. And I think yes, exactly. That's what I I think I was just reading. That's right. That they like daily hits are more than all three of those combined. Right. Yeah, so um, yeah. So there are uh, basically it it contains all kinds of images and videos that are on one hand um you know in some cases like or in many cases non-consensual and now i have a feeling i think that those videos can include people who are both children but also of all kinds of ages but our we our focus really was on um material including children and then child sexual abuse material and um remember that there were i mean you could find over a hundred thousand videos i think with searches like girls under 18 or 14 year old girls um and this has been going on for years and there have been victims who um say in the case of you know, say a girl and she has a boyfriend who convinces her into taking some pictures or some videos and they end up on this website. And then we heard from victim after victim like that, who, who begged and pleaded and had to contact them dozens and dozens of times asking them to take the images down and just hit roadblock after roadblock. And then, you know, and then, then basically the the website have, but you know, turning around and basically saying, "Well, prove who you are," um, and then it became this, um, in many cases, such a re-victimizing, traumatic experience. And of course, it's already out there, right? So, um, and then, and then there are there are videos that are outright child sexual um, assault and child sexual abuse, and um, there are claims, of course, that there are videos that um, are of children who are 
um, victims in human trafficking for those purposes too. So how did this start, Arnold? We first, I think you first sent, we first, like before the committee took this on, did you were writing to ministers already and we were already, we were asking questions. I remember, I think even in December, asking the like public safety minister or justice minister to take action. And remember originally right off the bat, they were so cagey, like they, um, they did, you know, I mean, they, it was just all rhetoric about, you know, their hand over their heart and how badly they felt, but, um, and they did promise that legislation would be coming. And, um, I sure as heck hope that the legislation uh, they're uh, that they're not pretending that the legislation that they're uh, bringing in to deal with this travesty is C10, by the way, but um, because C10 does nothing about these issues, as we know. Um, and so then the ethics committee brought um, many victims and survivors to hear from them about their experiences. And then also the heads of Pornhub and MindGeek. And was it that, I mean, that was, you asked some very, very good questions, I thought, with the, the proponents of that website. Yeah, yeah so, so uh, MindGeek uh, is based in Montreal. So that's kind of the reason that like our ethics committee got started with all of this, because there was, um, there was international pressure was probably one of the reasons why that got started, because uh, there was a petition with over a million signatures from an international audience and uh, there was calls in the in the states for this investigation and things like that and the prime right. minister was the prime minister was getting hassled about it at his morning yeah. press conferences so the, right. it, the the committee was initiated by uh, a liberal member nathan erskine smith um, originally that was uh, that's how they that study got started uh, so that was uh, oh yeah it was hey interesting yeah. 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 So, so it, 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 Nathan Erskine Smith's also an interesting liberal that. Yes. Uh, also independent minded. Yeah. Uh, although typically uh, falls on the uh, the wrong side of the issues, in my opinion. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, he he does wrote speak. So yeah, that was uh, yeah that uh, that was uh, interesting as well that we we subbed in for that um, because we were it was more of public safety and it was just something that I'd been working on for a long time. Um, so it was an honor to be able to sub in uh, with you there. That was uh, yeah. the, so um, I don't know if you can just tell folks um, maybe the status of that committee and that report, um, if you've been kind of keeping up on that, but. Yeah. So I know that the report's being worked on and we, um, I, I've read, uh, this is maybe something that people might be interested in. We had, um, I think just at the commencement of that study, remind me if I'm wrong, Arnold, I think maybe at the commencement of the study and then after we followed up, um, because asking for the RCMP to investigate, because I remember this distinctly, um, what was it, the third or fourth meeting, I think that we had, and we had representatives of the RCMP there and Commissioner Lucky and asked her point blank, if there were investigations and um, she sort of evaded doing the normal, we can't talk about specific investigations, even though, I mean, saying yes or no, or a number, I really think doesn't actually impede into any investigation. But I think originally the RCMP had sort of pushed it off, right? And then by the time she came to committee had more recently then said, yes, the request to investigate was being considered. Um, but I think to this to this point, there's still I haven't heard anything about any investigation or you know any or certainly any charges being laid. Do you um I know that there's a class action lawsuit going on. Do you know yep. details about that? Yeah. I don't like I know that there is uh, that it started and that uh, like I've been coordinating with a number of organizations from across the country to get people aware that this class actions lawsuit is is going on and that if people have been victims of Pornhub to contact the, the particular lawyer involved in the class action lawsuit um so that's that is ongoing um and yeah if you if your if your story is one of those where 
uh, your images ended up on Pornhub without you knowing about it or wanting them there, um, yeah, contact my office and we can put you in touch with that class action lawsuit. I, I am connected to it in, in that respect. Um, but as, as it's progressing, I'm not real, real sure on it right now. But yeah, that's yeah. a civil suit, which is, um, which is where we go when we, we're not getting any, like, because yeah, the, like the right. challenge is, is that in Canada, you, you must report if you find um, child sexual abuse images on the internet, you're supposed to report them. Um, and MindGeek or Pornhub has never reported any of them. And it was fairly obvious that there was um, these, these videos were up on their website. And so that's, that's where they, they would be essentially found guilty is that they, they never reported these images, let alone the other part of it is you're being in possession of them or distributing yes. um, child explicit images. Those are, those are also criminal code, but yeah. they're, those are harder. Those are maybe harder to prove, but it's clear that Reporting of it is a criminal code as well. That will seem um, easier to 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 prove, but that hasn't happened yet either. So, and yeah. as far as I I'm aware, the ethics committee is kind of ground to a halt. So the the report's being prepared, but they have not really given drafting instructions or uh, or or really have come back to it since because this is the ethics committee, and so um, yes. it's being. <laughs> <laughs> it's being filibustered by the liberals right now because of uh, the ethical scandals that this government is is undergoing. So yes, that's the yes. that's where it's at right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. The, uh, I don't know if you just. Uh, I was wondering if you could just tell the story of Serena Philitis. Uh, she was one of our very first victim witnesses that that came. Um, just so the folks that haven't seen, or if you could just tell tell that story a little bit. Um, if you remember. Well, yeah, she was the person I was thinking about when I, um, well, that's, yeah, she was extremely moving and I hope people, I mean, maybe it's not really a thing that people want to spend their day doing, searching up parliamentary committees and watching them. Um, but I, if people are concerned or blown away by this topic or want to see what we're talking about, I really think listening to her testimony is worth it because um, I think there's probably a whole bunch of people and frankly parents who are just out in the world having no idea that that these kinds of things could happen. And she was one of these people who remember she had said in the beginning, like fairly, I think from a a very a smaller town. Um, was she even yes. homeschooled early on? Like she characterized herself as being sort of sheltered and um, in in the beginning, sort of in her early years, and then went to another, went to a school, I think a junior high, right? Yeah, yeah. She so she was from like a mountainous region of like New New England, and yeah. so like the the elementary she, school she went to was like two hundred kids, and then yeah, she went, she went to a. Uh, um, then she went to a, a junior high and then it was like a couple thousand kids. Yeah. Yeah. And this was sort of the situation where I think had her, got her first boyfriend and things sort of progressed and went along to the point that some of these pictures were taken of her, but then they ended up on this website and, um, which was 14 when she was 14 and, then of course that went around like wildfire and she tried to get away from it, didn't she? And she couldn't, then I think she went to another school and immediately they all knew about it too. And she just went in this battle to try to get her images down. And I remember the moment, one of the most heartbreaking things was when she started off trying to deal with it all herself, right? Because she was afraid to tell, tell her mom and so she was trying to get it dealt with and they were just basically ignoring her. And then finally she did tell her mom and even her mom contacted them and tried to get it down. And same thing, just went around and around and around with them, you know, either for months and months and months, not answering and then saying they would take it, take it down and then not taking it down. And um, 
yeah, that, that was heartbreaking. And I thought, um, I think that probably lots of parents, first of all, can't really imagine how easily that could happen. But then second of all, I think what I was really struck with was how hard, it, how difficult it was for them to get it dealt with. Oh. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Am I freezing or cutting out? I know my, my, our rural internet. I think you talked about this topic not too long ago. Our rural internet is sketchy out here, but um, yeah. And then, you know, even playing games around with the mom and not, you know, not listening to her, not taking it down. Like at least you think as a parent, if this horrible, horrible thing happened that, you know, once you got involved, that should be pretty easy to turn it around. But um, they just played so many games with her. So Arnold, I was thinking lots like, you know, are we missing something here? Um, you know, they must need some sort of legislative tools that don't exist or some sort of policy. I know there's one coming up that you know a little bit about in the Senate that I think will make a make a difference. But what really struck me was when there was the representative of um, Friends of Canadian Broadcasting, and he explicitly said, uh, this is not a matter of a lack of law. He said, like, when you see the, these particular images and videos that we are talking about absolutely fall under the category of child pornography. These websites, having them and distributing them, they fall mm -hmm. under the category of child pornography. And he said outright, you know, I remember the moment that he said, do we actually really need like a brand new law passed to tell us that, you know, a website having child sexual abuse material online is wrong? No, but what clearly is happening is that there's an utter failure in um, actually applying and forcing the law and then following up on investigations, charges and convictions when it's warranted. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's um, that's the reality uh, that the system is just not not working in that respect. And and obviously because it's not working, hence MindGeek and Pornhub are located in Canada. Um, yes. right? they're not located, they're not located in the UK, they're not located in the United States, they're not located in Australia. Um, because if if they were all located there, they would have been run out of town before like much earlier kind of thing so that's that's a, a kind of a blight on our canadian reputation i suppose and that's that's a whole nother aspect to this yeah. this whole story and then they have and then but they did have remember when we were asking about like where they file their taxes and things like that it turns out that it was it's just a big spider web in that company right because then yeah where do they have, they did have some sort of like offshore kind of address or account or something. Yeah. So they have a, they have a um, location in Luxembourg and that's for tax right. purposes. And then they have, if you want to sue them, um, then you have to file in Cyprus. Yeah. If you want oh, to, yes. if you, if you want to serve them, um, then you have to serve them in, in address in Cyprus. So yeah, it, it, they have an extremely murky. Oh no, I think my internet is frozen. Maybe it'll pop back. And they just smiled. That was that was frustrating yes okay i'm seeing on what? my end that your network band your network bandwidth is low but mine usually mine usually is oh so I don't know if you can tell on your end okay but... well See, i, what uh, happens I when we're both out in the boonies yeah well it's snowing outside so that's probably not helping anything um mm -hmm. so the one of the other areas that i'm sure my constituents want to hear about a little bit about um, in the last few minutes that we got here is just around uh, C21 and C22. Um, these are some uh, criminal code amendments that the Liberal government has brought in. C21 is particularly around firearms and soft uh, airsoft guns. Yeah. Uh, and C22 is about um, being soft on crime. So I don't know if you want to just talk about both of them together or individually. 
Um, sure. C C start with C21, I guess. But Yeah. Yeah. So C21, I think the most important thing for all your constituents to know is we conservatives are doing everything we can to stop this legislation. Um, our leader, Erin O'Toole, has uh, made it clear that we will repeal C21 if it's passed. Um, we will repeal um, the OIC that just unilaterally prohibited um, well, at that point, it was 1,500 firearms, but now it's up over 1,900 because, of course, they just keep expanding the list every time you turn around. Um, they, this is where Bill Blair, the public safety minister, claims that they're not targeting, for example, firearms used in hunting, except that, of course, it built into their legis legislation is exemption for exemptions for Indigenous people because they do indeed use many of the firearms on that list for for hunting. So, I mean, our view is that everybody should get an exemption uh, from C21. They should scrap that legislation altogether. But I just point that out by way of saying it's quite clear their, um, you know, their claim is untrue. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you wouldn't require such an exemption. Um, so the fire, so, but then on top of that, your constituents probably have heard uh, uh, the comment that you just made and thought it was a joke because I've had lots of people contact me and say, that bill, they're not really targeting airsoft, BB, airsoft guns, BB guns, and and uh, pellet guns, are they? And yes, they are. That is also going to be paint, paintball guns. Yeah. Sorry, I meant yeah. Thank you. I meant paintball, paintball guns. Exactly. Um, so they uh, that is caught in Bill C twenty one, and so that's going to have a massive um, ripple economic effect on the entire sector of of. Um, you know, guys, retailers who sell um, airsoft guns plus accessories plus run um, these clubs and, and recreational facilities. But this bill is just typical um, liberals trying to act like they are doing one thing while they're actually doing another. And um, I think a couple of the most concerning parts of the legislation is um, they are allowing for, in effect, what could open the door towards just warrantless search and seizures um, and almost like almost in a way necessitate their legislation almost will put um, frontline law enforcement officers in the position of of um, needing to go in and search and seize uh, rather than, you know, face repercussions. And um, they also are taking measures where they're going to give municipalities the ability to le legislate on handgun, um, transporting, use, um, uh, storage. But the way that they're doing it, and this is maybe one of the aspects that is the biggest proof of, of what conservatives are saying, which is that this is targeting law-abiding firearms owners, the way that they're going to enforce it is to make these municipal bylaws a condition on firearms licenses. So you know as well as I do that, for example, I mean our poor our poor friends and neighbors there in in Vancouver and Langley area. I mean they've been probably if you, if your viewers have seen in the news, um, they uh, just over the last month they've had a ton of gang shootings there. Um, Toronto has a massive gang increases in gang shootings under these liberals and you know the gangbangers and the criminals committing crimes with firearms are not worrying about their municipal they're not going to worry about their municipal handgun um, bylaw paperwork just like they don't ever worry about doing things by the book or following the rules um, with firearms that are mostly illegal smuggle, illegally smuggled, illegally imported, illegally trafficked, and when they're used in crime. So there's a whole, there's actually, the Bill, Bill C-21 is actually massive. It, it, um, um, it impacts, I think, 15 different separate pieces of legislation, but all in all, I, the main takeaway is that it really um, will do nothing about illegal smuggling and trafficking. It doesn't target gang activity and gang shootings. And um, it flips much of the system for law-abiding people to a uh, guilty until proven innocent system rather than the other way around. Which, and, and all through this, the liberals are trying to claim that they're doing, um, that this law is to protect public and personal safety of Canadians. It's really, it's really distasteful. And um, I think in many ways, a very, you know, a very, a very uh, 
scary precedent actually that they're about to set with this legislation. I should maybe I'll just mention too on this on this point, Arnold. Your your many of your constituents have probably heard um, or read that the Sun column that uh, there are criminal defense lawyers who believe that the long gun registry, which was supposed to have been disbanded in 2012, uh, has been maintained. I just want you to know, and, and for your, I mean, you know this, but I just want your constituents to know that we have, um, we are pursuing this issue. We have asked for accountability and transparency uh, from the RCMP commissioner and uh, for them to tell us what the facts are. We'll keep pursuing that issue too. I just want to throw that in there in case um, you have farmers and hunters and law abiding farms owners in your riding who are wondering about that. We are taking it on. But so then, but to your point, um, and kind of in the context of what we were just we, about this topic we were talking about earlier, you know, measures that actually protect vulnerable people and protect victims of crime. Um, the Liberals said on one hand, they're bringing in C21, saying that it would protect public safety. And then immediately afterwards, they brought in C22, which um, they tried to say in the beginning was about supporting uh, people with drug addictions. And then um, we got the bill and our colleague, uh, Rob Moore, who's the Shadow Minister for Justice is the lead on it. And I was working with him um, as I do on C21 too in support of that. And as we were going through the details of the bill, it is, it is absolute classic soft on crime, hug a thug legislation from the liberals. They are, it reduces penalties for a series of serious crimes. It will allow for house arrest um for a whole for a whole number of crimes and Arnold I keep telling myself I'm going to memorize this but I have the list here and I think that your constituents would be shocked to know and just so they know it's not conservatives just saying this this is right from the bill so here are uh, you know and this I just a mindful of this given the first thing that we were we were given the first issue that we were talking about um about protecting victims and uh, uh, child victims and also any victims of non-consensual sexual images or videos being distributed. Here are a, a few of the offenses where um, the liberals would now allow for conditional sentencing, including things like health, house arrest. So that includes, um, well, prison breach. I wasn't even going to say that one, but I guess like, yeah, that's not cool. Anyway, uh, but here are the offenses, criminal harassment, sexual assault, kidnapping, trafficking in persons for material benefit, abduction of a person under 14. Um, here's a couple of other ones, causing bodily harm by criminal negligence, assault causing bodily harm or with a weapon. So, you know, this is, uh, I think, okay, like, so yeah, so it in, so this could mean that an individual who commits sexual assault could serve their sentence at home in the same neighborhood, you know, obviously as the victim. I mean, this, to me, this is a clear danger to public safety. It's going in exactly the opposite direction. And then, but what's, so, I mean, that's to, for, for you to, for the advocacy that we're doing to protect, um, children and and uh, and other victims against these websites and fighting for tougher penalties for serious offenses in the first place is uh, <laughs> like here is what they're actually doing in C22 but then um what's also crazy is they're reducing penalties for a whole bunch of um serious offenses with firearms and weapons too while pretending that C21 that targets law abiding firearms owners will make communities and cities safer. And it's just not true. Well, uh, that's bringing us to the end of our hour here. I We do got a couple of folks uh, that have joined us on the Zoom call this evening. Um, just wondering if, uh, if Dale, you want to let them in and if they've got any questions uh, or comments that they wanted to make here. Greg, Greg and Tina. Greg, thanks for joining us. Uh, do either of you have uh, any questions or comments that you'd like to make this evening? Just unmute yourself there. All right. 
<laughs> don't don't mean to put you on the spot there. That's Guy. that's all right. <laughs> I got the button pressed. It's okay. Um, yeah. So I I work for Tina, and like honestly, it's just incredible working for her. Like I'm I'm relatively new here, and so just a comment, I guess. Like for your constituents, Shannon's definitely one of the good MPs. I'm very proud to be an honorary Albertan at this point in time, despite residing in Ottawa. And yeah, like the, the work that she's doing is just awesome and incredible and, and seeing what the two of you guys are doing in Parliament to really make a difference for Canadians. It's so incredible. All right. Well, th thanks for the ringing endorsement, Greg. Uh, but don't worry, folks, we never paid him. Um, but we appreciate you coming on this evening. <laughs> we didn't set that up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So good. Well, uh, um, the uh, Dale, is there any um, f any comments or questions in the Facebook chat there that we got to run over? I think it was just more people were just like in, in shock and just mentioning kind of if people actually really knew what was going on, particularly with Pornhub, uh, how oh, yeah. people would be responding. That was kind of one of the major comments, if only people yeah. knew. And so, yeah, recommendations either on readings or things that people might be able to do to learn more about that. Do you have any recommendations for people to learn more? Well, there's- yeah, article, uh, What about that New York Times yeah. article? Yeah, That'd so be a good place to start, right? Yeah, so there's a New York Times article from uh, the end of November, 2020. Um, and it's called The Children of Pornhub is the title of the, of the New York Times article. And I think if you start there, um, uh, give you a, an expose on on what's the what the issue is all about um yeah it's and it's a major black eye on like the canadian landscape no doubt so with that yeah, uh, shannon i i want to thank you for for coming making your way all the way to to northern alberta uh you know from the from the deep south of two hills there and uh <laughs> thanks <Carol. laughs> Hey, yeah, Thanks. what's the weather doing at your place now? It's it's pretty gray out here and pouring still. It, I think it's supposed yeah. to be the middle of the night or turn to snow. It's it's a very like slowly falling rain that might be like snow turning to rain as it comes down. Mm. So yeah, it's pretty gross out there. So yeah, welcome to welcome to Northern Alberta, where if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. Just wait five minutes. Yes, I know lots of guys who scrambled all through the night to get their seating in, though. So, so because out here it's really dry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it has been, been has been pretty dry. So we're we're happy to have the rain. So yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, Shannon. And uh, yeah, um, can uh, Northern Alberta, Peace River, Westlock, still the honey capital of Canada. And uh, it's a pretty sweet place. And so yeah. uh, thanks thanks for joining us here. Look forward yeah, to seeing you in, in Ottawa very soon. Yes, that sounds good. Hey, thanks for having me, Arnold. No problem. Have a good night. <laughs>